Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to do an introduction to Darcy's Law, which forms the basis of our governing equation and really is the foundation of groundwater modeling and flow through porous media. So what is Darcy's Law? Uh, Henry Darcy was a French civil engineer who lived in Paris back in the 1800s. And he had an interesting job. Uh, at that time, uh, Paris was in many ways the, the scientific center of the world. Um, so many great discoveries in mathematics and engineering and science and biology and medicine happened in Paris in the 1800s. And uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, the, the French built the Suez Canal, uh, the Eiffel Tower, uh, Paris Metro, uh, the extensive sewer and storm drain system, uh, really uh, were advanced in terms of civil engineering and infrastructure. And they also had uh, municipal water supply. And the water that they would uh, put in pipes to distribute through the city uh, had to first go through some kind of purification system and you know they didn't understand water treatment as well as we do today however to filter a lot of the particulates out of the water they would run the water through a giant set of filters these would be uh, start with coarse gravel and then finer gravel and sand, and that would remove a lot of the particulates and uh, silt and things in the water so that by the time it got to the other side, it was relatively clean and could be distributed th through the pipes. Now, imagine if you're trying to design a filter as an engineer and you need to determine how much water uh, or excuse me, you probably start out with, with uh, knowing how much water you can pull from your reservoir in terms of a flow rate, cubic meters per day, something like that. And then you have to design a filter. I'm, they understood the, the concept of hydraulic head and how you get head loss as you move something through a filter. And the finer the material, the more, the he, the more head loss you get. <clears throat> But uh, they, they knew they had to make the, the, the filters a certain size and length. But um, how do you go about doing that? And so Henry Darcy did a series of uh, tests in a laboratory where he took uh, columns of soil, as shown here, and uh, had water fed into one side, uh, and the water coming in was maintained at a certain head, which we'll call head two here. And then the water would go through the soil, which would act kind of like a filter. There would be head loss as that happens. And then it would be drained off into, a, into some sort of container. There was a, a little spout that would maintain a consistent head or water level on the downstream side. And uh, he would also vary the length of the column of soil and the cross-sectional area and vary the the head difference as well and record how much water would come into the cup so what what kind of uh, volumetric flow rate would you get through this system over a certain period of time uh, these experiments were published in a book called the public fountains of the city of dijon in 1856. Uh, some of these experiences were done in the 1830s all the way up through 1856. And uh, he, based on these observations and these tests, uh, he came up with a simple equation um, which we now call Darcy's Law. And so Darcy's Law uh, is uh, Q is equal to Ka times H2 minus H1 over L, where uh, Q is equal to the volumetric flow rate, the volume of flow that goes through the soil in a certain period of time. So this would be 
like cubic feet per second, cubic feet per day, or cubic, in, in this case, it was, I'm sure it was cubic meters or cubic centimeters over a certain length of time, how much, how much water is going through the system. Uh, the term K is a constant that is a function of this, how permeable the soil is. So it's called the coefficient of permeability or hydraulic conductivity. Um, a is the gross cross-sectional area of flow of the cylinder. Um, and when we say gross, we mean not just the soil area, but the water area, just the entire area, cross-sectional area that's flow flowing through. We'll come back to that. Uh, H is equal to total, total head, and uh, H2 minus H1 is the head difference as, as you go from the input to the output, and then L is the length of the flow path that it goes through. So let's think about this for a second. Um, so what this says, if you look at, it's just a simple algebraic equation. Um, the greater the cross-sectional area, the more flow you have. So the flow is, is linearly proportional to the area. That should be intuitive. The bigger pipe, bigger flow. And then <clears throat> since the H2 H minus H1 term is on the, the numerator, uh, that means uh, the larger the head difference, the larger the flow. Those are linearly related. And then the length of the column is in the denominator. So the flow is inversely, inversely proportional to the length of soil that it has to go through. Um, you know, the, the more distance it has to travel, the more energy it takes. And so, uh, you know, for a given head difference, uh, if you double the length, you're going to reduce your flow rate by half. And then finally, this coefficient k, we determine that experimentally uh, using a test, much like the one shown on the first slide. And that has units of length per time. Uh, so centimeters per second, meters per day, feet per day. And that is a function of how permeable the soil is. Um, gravel for example, would have a very large value, and sand or clay would have a smaller value. So that is Darcy's Law. Um, should be kind of intuitive. It makes sense. The beauty of it is it's very simple. And sometimes you will see Darcy's Law written in this form. Q is equal to KIA. And uh, what's been done here is the I term is called the hydraulic gradient, and we've just lumped the, the head change divided by L uh, into uh, a single term. So it's the, it's the change in head divided by the length. It's called a gradient because it's, it represents how rapidly the head is changing uh, versus distance. And the greater the hydraulic gradient, the greater the flow rate. It's linearly proportional to the, uh, to the hydraulic gradient. Uh, this can also be written in, in a derivative form as uh, minus dh ds. And sometimes you will see Darcy's Law written in this form. In fact, when we go through our governing equation derivation, uh, and in one of our upcoming lectures, this is actually the form we will use. So uh, dH dS means um, it's, it's the hydraulic gradient represented as a derivative. Um, now the minus sign is important here because if you look up above uh, this H2 minus H1, um, that's actually, it's basically the high head where it starts minus the low head where it finishes uh, is, is the change in head. But when you do a derivative, uh, it's typically the, the head you end up with minus the head where you, where you start. So if you go from a high head to a low head, this derivative uh, dh, ds would be negative. And we put the minus sign on there because water flows from high head to low head, so it flows in the direction of maximum negative gradient. Um, and so in order to, you know, a positive flow rate would mean 
you know, water flowing in a certain direction. And so to get the sign to work out, we have to put a, a minus sign on. So if you see the derivative form, we use a minus sign. If you're just lumping delta H in there, we just make sure that we have the proper, we've, we've, done, we've done it in the proper order to make it positive, but these are both very common uh, representations of Darcy's Law. There's another way we can uh, write Darcy's Law, which we sometimes see. If you take uh, Q is equal to KIA and divide both sides by A, uh, volumetric flow rate divided by area equals velocity. And on the right side, the areas cancel and you end up with this term VD equals KI. Sometimes they put the D subscript on there, sometimes they don't. But uh, the D, so basically V equals KI. Sometimes you see this, the, the, the flow velocity in porous media is equal to the hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the hydraulic gradient. So what, what, is, what does this mean? We gotta be careful. It's tempting to think of uh, V as the, the, the speed at which water is flowing in the soil, but that's not quite right. Remember what we've done is, is we've taken this column of soil, I'm laying it on its side here, and we're taking the, uh, the total flow rate and dividing it, dividing it by the full cross-sectional area. So, uh, Basically, the Darcy velocity is how fast the water would be flowing in the empty pipe on either side of the soil. Um, again, if we take the total flow rate and divide by the total area, you're getting the flow in the pipe. By contrast, uh, the water that flows in the soil itself flows at what we call the seepage velocity. And why are they different? Um, it's because the, the water that's flowing through the soil is going through just the pore space, the void space in the soil. So if you take that, that same volumetric flow rate and you push it through that much smaller cross-sectional area, uh, you're going to get the seepage velocity should be greater than the Darcy velocity. Okay, um, and now let's let's drill down into this um, a little more closely. So, how do we how do we determine the difference between the seepage velocity and the Darcy velocity? Uh, so, if if you if you look at the ratio between the area that the flow occurs, the the area of the pore space in the soil cross section and divide that by the total area, that should be equal to the volume of the voids in the soil divided by the total volume. And that, uh, so that V sub V is a volume of voids, V is a total volume, and uh, N, this term, uh, volume of voids divided by total volume is what we call porosity. Um, and, Based on that, if we take a look, so, so let's say this is our cross-section of the soil. The blue represents the pore space filled with water, and the brown represents the, the rock or the soil. So uh, the porosity N is equal to the blue area divided by the total area. Therefore, if we say the seepage velocity should be equal to the total flow rate Q divided by just the area of flow, the blue area. And if we take this equation and we multiply the top and the bottom by the total cross-sectional area A, uh, the Q over A term represents the Darcy velocity, so the, the flow rate divided by the total area. And then the area, uh, the total area divided by the area of flow is like the inverse of porosity. Um, if you take the, air, the blue area divided by the total area, you'd have porosity. So if you flip that upside down, you get one over the 
reciprocity. Therefore, uh, there's a very simple relationship between seepage velocity and Darcy velocity. You, to get the seepage velocity, you simply divide the Darcy velocity by the porosity of the soil. And so another way to write Darcy's law, uh, VD equals KI, but VS equals KI divided by porosity. So um, we now have a way to get an estimate of what the seepage velocity should be. So this is really important when we apply Darcy's law. <clears throat> boy, we've got to remember to, to divide by porosity uh, to get, if, if, we're, if we're back calculating the velocity, it's important to divide by the porosity so that we're getting the actual seepage velocity and not the Darcy velocity. The Darcy velocity by itself doesn't necessarily have a useful physical meaning um, in flow through porous media, but the seepage velocity certainly does. Now let's look at some of these ratios here in this table. <clears throat> I've listed some porosities. I, I probably should have started this at a lower number. <clears throat> um, in fractured rock you can have porosities down on the order of you know 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.05, something like that. Um, actually 0 0.25, 0 0.3 would be you know, relatively typical porosities for uh, sand or gravel. 0.4 would be very high. And so you can look at the ratio for those particular porosities. If you look at the ratio of seepage to discharge velocity, we're talking, you know, a pretty significant difference. And so that's why this becomes important. Now, this gets uh, a little more interesting. Um, it turns out that uh, we need to modify this one more step uh, because not all of the voids in the soil necessarily conduct flow. So we were talking about the, the area of flow as part of that gross cross-sectional area. Well, let's suppose you have fractured rock, and I've got some really big fractures here that aren't very realistic, but just to illustrate the point, but uh, theoretically you could have uh, some preferential flow paths and then some kind of dead zones where, where, not, where it's filled with water but not much flow occurs. If you took the entire porosity and calculated the seepage velocity using the entire porosity, you would end up uh, with a seepage velocity that's too slow. If the actual area of flow uh, is smaller, you're going to have uh, a much higher velocity or bigger differential. So there's a new term we call, we use, uh, which is called effective porosity, or N sub E, and that's equal to uh, AF over A, where AF is the actual area of flow. It could be some fracture of the void space, um, the, 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 the poor, the, the saturated water area of your cross section. It's just what fraction of that. Uh, actually conducts flow and therefore the most appropriate way to represent seepage velocity is ki over n sub e where n sub e is the effective porosity so if you think about it effective porosity is going to be equal to some fraction of the total porosity um, you can sometimes it's written like this with a lambda where lambda is the effective porosity factor. We determine it's experimentally, and it varies between uh, zero and one. Uh, if you have <clears throat> relatively clean sands and gravels, the effective porosity will be, uh, a, a, it'll be approximately one, meaning all of the voids in the soil are active in conducting flow. However, it can be quite small. I mentioned fractured rock earlier. Uh, the effective porosity factor could be as low as 1%. Um, that is a typo. Well, no, that's, 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 that's okay. 
0.01, maybe up to 0.5 for clays or fractured rock, but it can be uh, quite small. So there are going to be a number of times in our exercises and our homework we're going to be calculating seepage velocity from Darcy's Law. And when we do so, we're going to uh, use effective porosity, which is something that I'll be providing to you when you need it. Okay, finally, a um, couple more things to look at and understand um, we've been using the term hydraulic conductivity uh, in the equation for Darcy's law Q is equal to KIA the term K is a constant <clears throat> which we determine experimentally or estimate it and it actually depends on both the fluid and the soil that is why we often call it hydraulic conductivity hydraulic implies water however you can rewrite Darcy's law in this form, Q is equal to minus capital K gamma F over mu times dH dx times A. The minus dH dx, again, we're back to the derivative form. A is the cross-sectional area. But in this case, we've got a different K. Instead of hydraulic conductivity with units of uh, length per time, this is the constant of proportionality or often called the intrinsic permeability or the permeability and it has units of length squared and it is based on the soil properties only so where does the where do the fluid properties come in uh, that comes in in the gamma F which is the unit weight of the fluid which is uh, force per length cubed and um, at mu is the viscosity of the fluid mass times length over time and so if you look at this equation in the lower left corner of the slide and compare it to the equation we saw earlier what's happened is we've inserted instead of a single lowercase k uh, we now have K times gamma over mu. <clears throat> and therefore, um, as long as you use the proper unit weight of the fluid and viscosity, uh, you, could, uh, you could derive, uh, or you could switch back and forth between hydraulic conductivity and, um, and the intrinsic permeability form. So, um, this can also be written in this form. Instead of unit weight, we have density and gravity. <clears throat> um, I think I'm missing a minus sign here. This should have a minus sign in it because um, we're still using the derivative form. And this form is used uh, among other places, but primarily in the petroleum industry. And why do they prefer this form in the petroleum industry? Because they're often, sometimes they're dealing with water, but they could be dealing with natural gas or crude oil um, or fracking fluid that they put into the ground, all of which have different uh, unit weight and viscosity. And so by using uh, this capital K, which is a function of the soil only, they can apply this equation to different kinds of fluids um, uh, with this new, this new form of Darcy's Law. And so uh, in this form, this uh, capital K is often expressed in units of Darcy's after our friend uh, Henry Darcy. And, you know, it's a one, uh, let's see, uh, one Darcy is 0.987 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Um, so it's based on uh, how much water flows with a certain viscosity and certain pressure. Um, again, this is just for background information, but uh, for example, for water, at 20 degrees centigrade, the, the temperature of the water controls its viscosity and density. So uh, we could calculate um, 
with these given values of viscosity and density and so forth as the gravitational coefficient there we can come up with a uh, for an, for a hydraulic conductivity that would be one centimeters per second you end up with the intrinsic permeability of uh, 1.02 times 10 to the fifth 10 to the minus fifth centimeter square so this alternative form of Darcy's law that is based on intrinsic permeability and includes the fluid properties is just for your information. In this class, we're dealing with groundwater. Therefore, we will use hydraulic conductivity. This was presented as background in case you see this other formation of uh, Darcy's law. Finally, um, years ago I taught this course and, and in the student comments somebody said I took the whole course and I still don't know how to estimate hydraulic conductivity so I'm trying to be a little more proactive and try to give you a sense of, of what a reasonable range of hydraulic conductivities are for different types of soil. Uh, this is a fairly standard representation of how hydraulic conductivity varies and so the two most common units we use for hydraulic conductivity in metric units, we often use centimeters per second. And in English units, we often use feet per day. Why, why seconds for one and days for the other? I'm not sure, but this, these are the two most common uh, ways we represent hydraulic conductivity in each of those. And they differ from one another by a factor of about three orders of magnitude, roughly. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, looking at feet per day, <clears throat> generally, let, let's look at this term that says good aquifer. So a good aquifer is something where uh, it's going to, the water will flow through it uh, quite easily, and we can pump water out using wells without expending too much energy and we can get a good draw. So you, you need to have a hydraulic conductivity of, of about one or greater. Uh, it's not uncommon to have hydraulic conductivities uh, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200 uh, for an aquifer. And then likewise, you know, we're talking about uh, 0.01 centimeters per second or greater. Uh, all the way up to, you know, maybe one centimeter per second um, being a more typical range. I did encounter a, a, an aquifer in Hawaii once that had hydraulic conductivity of 10,000 feet per day, which is kind of what it, it was a, a really porous uh, igneous rock, lava, basically near Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. So sometimes you'll see super high hydraulic conductivities. And then another benchmark for me, <clears throat> if you look down the scale here, <clears throat> if you're ever designing a landfill or a liner uh, for a water containment facility, generally we like to see a compacted clay liner be on the order of 10 to the minus 7th, 10 to the minus 8th centimeters per second. <clears throat> and if you have a foot of standing or about a, uh, you know, a third of a meter or a foot of water standing on top of a clay liner, it would take about 30 years for it to get to travel through the liner if your hydraulic conductivity is that low. So that's a, that's another basis. And so that, that would be uh, kind of a low permeability clay. Anyway, this is from Wikipedia. <clears throat> uh, this particular page, uh, this slide, um, you might want to hang on to this. Uh, we'll refer back to this occasionally. Um, it's a really useful one to study and, and get familiar with. And, and as, we, as we go through our sample problems this semester, we'll refer back to this occasionally. So that wraps up our introduction to uh, Darcy's Law. Um, and uh, going forward, we'll now apply that to a number of different uh, problems and incredibly a simple yet useful equation to describe how water flows through porous medium.